Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode number 51. Today, we're going to be talking about the best games of 2018. I have to say that the third time you did that intro was a lot less enthusiastic than the last time. I mean, I only have so much inside of me. <laughs> <laughs> so much enthusiasm, and uh, sometimes I just blow it all in the first go. I'm a fan of the first take, personally. Yeah, the first take was good. Yeah, but apparently it echoed, so... It echoed, I don't know. Yeah. Sound, yeah. audio second, recording guys, equipment. Guys, people listening at home right now, the second take was th- so enthusiastic that it rattled Orion and I, and, and then that threw Mark off and we had to redo it a third time. Yeah, well... I was also mid-chew and trying to decide <laughs> if I could say hello without sounding <laughs> super weird. We're all professionals here, eating pizza and having audio problems. Anyways, as you've heard already... Uh, my name is Mark. Today on the podcast is Matt. Hi. And Orion, who is chewing. <laughs> Pause for effect. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> oh, gosh. This is going to be the worst one ever. We, we, we continually <laughs> outdo ourselves, guys. Especially since Matt and I haven't played half the list. <laughs> not my fault <laughs> oh man I'm anyways we're gonna I'm... talk about the best of 2018 it's not just gonna be a countdown of my favorite games but we'll talk about other games if you guys want to mention some favorite games uh we can do that also but by and large i'm cutting the time that i'm giving myself to play games for 2018 for this list because if i want if i waited till i played all of the games from 2018 that i wanted to play i would be doing this in like 2021 so yeah it's hard to play everything there's a lot there are a lot of games these days yeah you know like 5000 a year or something but even then there are like 100 that i wish i could play and i got to you know 40 or something like that in terms of games that I really wanted to play that I wasn't able to, I think Newton is probably highest on my list. That seems to be the most mm-hmm. promising I've heard, or at least the game I've heard the most people say, oh yeah, this is really good. And it's by it's by one or more of those Italian designers who keep releasing really good games. I saw a chart the other day. It was actually really cool. There's these four Italian designers, hmm. and between them, in some combination of solo design or duo or trios, they've made... I mean, Tzolkin was the first one. Uh, Lorenzo Il Magnifico, I've heard, is good. Grand Austria Hotel, I've heard, is good. Newton, I think Teotihuacan, a number of... Co- Coimbra, a number of really good, solid, oh, mid-heavy okay. Euro games that keep getting released. I didn't realize were by the same, like... Cohort. Group. I assume, yeah, they're, like, all interconnected, so they all know each other. I don't know if they're all friends or just happen to be... Yeah. to connect at some point because they're all Italian, but they keep putting out really nice mid to heavyweight Euro games. Was there anything else? Newton, you Newton, said? Newton, uh, I wanted to play Smartphone Inc. I want to play Raccoon Tycoon. I'm trying to think of what else. Captains of the Gulf, I, I've heard, is good. A lot of these like midweight Euros because there's, you know, I really like midweight Euros, but there's a lot of them that come out each year, so it's hard to, to get in a play of all of them. But I've played enough and I've played... Uh, a lot of games that I think were pretty good. Overall, I think, and this has kind of been a thing that some people have said, and it's been going around that 2018 was a bit of a down year. I think in comparison to 2017, that seems true. Because 2017, man, had a crazy, incredibly good list of games. I mean, besides like Gloomhaven and Spirit Island, you had Sidereal, you had... Lisboa. Oh yeah, um, Lisboa. I know there was a number of them because we've talked about this before about how 2017 is your second greatest design year of all time it's probably my favorite actually yeah 2017 at gloomhaven spirit island gaia project azul twilight imperium people really liked anachrony you had pandemic legacy 2 sagrada lisboa ethnos which there was a certain twitter thread about that people are getting nostalgic for i guess even though it's two years old fog of love pulsar noose fjord Man, oh, 2017 was great. A lot yeah. of really, really good games there. 2018 in comparison, I, I nothing got me super, super excited like Spirit Island or Gloomhaven or Lisboa did last year. But that doesn't mean it was a bad year. It just means it didn't have really, really high peaks for me. I think the games that people are really excited about from 2018 
are precisely the games that are on my disappointment list. So it might just be yeah. that I've, I've diverged a bit from yeah. the the kind of general consensus on some of these games, but yeah, we'll see. Anyways, that's my general thoughts for 2018. I don't know what you if you guys had any. Yeah, I mean, we've talked be- uh, before about just how in- industry wide things are, are improving, productions are better, theme integration are better, and, and, and those sorts of things are are still true across the board. There's no lack of really nicely made games. I think we yeah. just happen to not see the genuine home run designs that we saw last year. You know, one every once every five ten year kind of designs that happen to just group up. All right, you guys ready for my for the countdown? Let's hear it. Before we get to the countdown, I have three games here that were reprints or updates or like sequels that felt a little bit too close to the original game mm-hmm. for me to include as an original 2018 release. But all three of these would easily make my top five, I think. If I didn't put them in that category, this would be Brass. Birmingham, I guess, is the new one. It feels a bit too like Lancashire for me to count it as a brand new game. It, it's kind of a sequel, I guess, or it feels almost like the original game with a bit of an expansion pack. I don't know. It was borderline, but I figured uh, since Brass has been around for so long and it keeps all the core fundamentals of that game, I, w- I wouldn't include it in my list, uh, but it's very, very fun. Also because I like the original one a bit better. <laughs> Anyways, we have 1846, which got a great reprint from GMT, which has started our recent love of 18xx games. And I really like 1846, but it was originally designed like 13 years ago or something. And then the second edition of Pictomania, Vladik Vadal's really, really great drawing party game, which is my favorite of the drawing party games where you draw pictures and such. I never played party. the I never played the first edition, but from what I understand, they changed like two minor rules, and it's largely just a reprint of the game. But it was my first experience of it, and I yeah. it's one of my it, favorite party games. Yeah, it, from uh, from our Vladicon uh, friends, it did seem like the new one is strictly better. I have not jumped into the 18x games as you and Orion have, um, so I look forward to hearing what you have to say about that genre. But the other two, Pictomania and and Brass, w- were both highlights of the year for me yeah all very very fun we got to get you in a game of 1846 soon yeah it, it, they look so uh fascinating for sure yeah all right with that being said we'll run through a quick i really wanted to focus on the top five just because i don't want to spend the whole podcast talking about my list but matt wanted to see what my 10 through 6 were so we'll go very quickly 10 through 6 and then talk more in depth about the top five number 10 is hardback by tim fowers uh, i got mm-hmm. to play this with Mark, who was on the podcast a couple episodes ago. And it is a deck-building word construction game where you're essentially the cards that you're able to play in the deck-building aspect, each hand, are gated by if you can make a word out of those letters. And there's different... It's got very basic deck-building stuff, money points. There are different factions, in this case genres of books, that kind of combo with each other like a Star Realms kind of thing. But I thought the... The word creation aspect of it made it made it more interesting than something like Star Realms. Uh, number nine, Doctor Esker's Notebook, which is a puzzle game. Uh, we started on a couple puzzle games. We got the one exit game, but I actually preferred this one by a little bit. Uh, this is a very very small production, kind of a one man thing that I reviewed on the site. So look it up. It's very difficult, but very well crafted, intelligently designed. Uh, so if you like those puzzle kind of games, I'd recommend that one. You, you said that this is something that you could start and then put down and pick up later? That's precisely what I did. I played it over two or three sessions. Yeah. Uh, it's It all fits in a little tuck box, and you could start and stop basically at any time, put it away, set it back up. Just everything is done very smartly to fit it onto basically a deck of cards. And man, I got to repeat, it's difficult. I looked up so many hints. Oh man, so many hints for that one. Number seven is... Teotihuacan, the again from that group of Italian designers, kind of a spiritual sequel to Tzolkin. I think I like after one play of Teotihuacan. I think I like Tzolkin a little bit better. Teotihuacan's a bit bigger, more complex. It's got some really neat ideas. This is one I think I could see going up in my estimation after playing it a bit more, or maybe going down. I'm not 100 percent sure, but it certainly is an intriguing game. Yeah, it was fun. I enjoyed playing it at 
Total Con? Yes. Yeah. And it's got a really cool physical element to it because you build a pyramid in the middle of the board as one of the main point generating parts of it. Kind of similar to how the Tzolkin has the gears that are so, I don't know, iconic and unique in that kind of that physical nature of the game so that was cool it if i had to criticize it it had so many little bits that you had to move around and upkeeping and each action triggered like steps on three different tracks which could add a lot of strategic elements once you've played it a few times but it was a lot of work to remember all the triggers that you had to all the little steps you had to do every time you did something yeah definitely not as lean as zulkin but it could, I, I think it could end up being very, very good once you have a stronger grasp of the game. But again, it could also kind of fall apart. Yeah. My first play, I, I certainly enjoyed, and I think it, it's, it has a lot of interesting stuff going for it, which is why it's kind of rated where it is. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah. Number six is Pass Tally, which we talked about on the PAX East podcast. And this is a small Japanese, I believe, game. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Or was it Chinese? I can't remember. From... I'm Anastasia. pretty sure Japanese. Pretty sure Japanese, which I guess is getting a U.S. printing at some point. It is, how do we describe it? It's Suro for gamers. It's the same yeah. Suro thing where you're, you're manipulating essentially a maze by drawing lines from the edges of the playing surface through a maze of lines on the board. Yeah. But it has a really cool scoring mechanism where you want to build up vertically. And, and, and if you have AP... This one will murder you. Yeah. You, you. This one, this one hurt me, and I usually am able to settle on something. But yeah, you can a lot certainly spatial stare at this zero sized board and just trace paths and possible paths for days. <laughs> but it looks beautiful. It looks so it, cool, and it plays in what thirty minutes, twenty minutes. I mean, you could play it in like fifteen to minutes to two hours. I think if I'm not on playing, who, you, depending yeah, on who's yeah. playing. Or depending on how seriously you want to take it, right? You could really sit down and treat it like a serious abstract game, or you could treat it as a kind of mid-light Euro, or not Euro, but I guess Euro game, but, you know, quick spatial game. Yeah. It's got that kind of range to it, I suppose. Number six is Decrypto, a kind of advancement on the code names thing. I, I can easily, I don't know if this is the actual background behind the game, but I could easily see someone playing code names and be like, wow, how can we iterate on this and make something similar but but different? And it makes, it essentially makes it a bit more complex by having two teams trying to almost intercept each other's clues and figure out it actually works on a thematic level better than code names because you're actually trying to intercept clues and, and gain yeah. meaning from that, so it yeah. works a bit better. I don't think it's as elegant. I don't think it's certainly not some as elegant. aspects and I of think, the game are yeah. as good as code names, but I've I've had fun with it for sure. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. I've played it with a handful of different groups, and and maybe the the thing that really knocks it down good step from code names is it's harder to integrate everyone of different ability levels maybe i i've played games where there's kind of one person who just can't quite get the clue giving and it doesn't it doesn't accentuate that to the point of like making an individual feel bad but everyone kind of knows that like well you know th- that person's clues ended up kind of ruining us anyway i i i think the new puzzle, the new word puzzle that it presents is absolutely fantastic. And if you love code names, you should definitely play this game. It's not that A plus tier for me. Yeah, this one it's along an A- with Crosstalk, which I think was a 2017 game, are kind of on the same tier for me of like, they're really good shakeups of code names, but I don't think I would rate them quite as highly as code names, which is one that I keep going back to again and again. And still fun. We played it just, what, a week ago about? Code names? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, still great. Still great. I haven't had a great time with Decrypto. I've only played it once, which is a huge caveat, of course. Uh, In that experience, I thought the clue giving was really cool and trying to link the order of clues in such a way that your team understands what you're going for and the other team is thrown off. But everything else I thought was either too gamey or just random and not fun. Yeah, I think putting maybe your statement together with my statement, I think it's harder to kind of fit everyone in to enjoy the game. Like, 
Yeah. I think, I don't know. I just, I just, this way, there's a lot more variance on your, what you're experiencing. Yeah. Like, I just find with code names, I haven't put code names on the table and felt like someone, you know, in my living room just had a bad time. Sure. I just, I've never come close to that with code names. And, and I think that the crypto isn't quite on that level of uh, inclusivity, even though it works for a lot of people in a lot of ways. All right, let's go to the top five proper. Number five is one we talked about again in the PAX East podcast, and that is Coimbra, a kind of midweight tactical Euro game with dice drafting and a little bit of kind of moving around on a board and lots of little other bits and pieces that you would see in Euro games. And I know in that podcast we talked about uh, the criticism that it did kind of feel like a hodgepodge of bits and pieces you see in other euro games but i love dice drafting i mean the dice drafting the, the core is fundamental great. gameplay of that yeah. game is just so fun yeah absolutely and i i can't deny that it, you know it's one of my favorite mechanisms in, in any game and i think it was done really well there and just because you've seen something before doesn't mean it's not implemented well in whatever place it was implemented next what game would you most closely um, compare Coimbra to. I'm trying to think, like, it, it, it did feel kind of unique to me just because of the dice drafting being so central. Role player, actually, which you haven't played. Yeah, correct. But it's got a similar feel where there's dice drafting and, well, and a little bit of Pulsar, but I think closer to role player where the better die you draft, or in this case, in Coimbra's case, kind of the, the more you bid for a particular spot with the way you draft, there are other repercussions so you have to balance out same with pulsar i suppose right you you draft better dice and you get hit on other categories of the game role player was kind of the same way where it had two separate drafts you drafted for dice and the the better dice essentially you got in there affected your your position in the draft for equipment so all of them have that same link coimbra is a bit more sprawling a little bit more hodgepodge uh, i think pulsar is a bit of a better game for me just because it's a bit more focused it's still a you know a big point salad but yeah i felt like i could focus in on more strategies and there was more fun to be had in the side elements of the game whereas coimbra seemed much more the success of coimbra is much more on the shoulders of the dice drafting element i would agree yeah. which is done fine but pulsar you yeah. know even if you aren't as excited as we are about the dice drafting element the other aspects of the game i find are very fun also yeah i think um i'm i, I kind of don't like the point salad type games uh, certainly in comparison to you mark mm -hmm. with pulsar which absolutely is a point salad i found that all the different aspects of the game all the sideways to score points felt integrated just because uh, almost like the strength of the physical presence of the you know the board itself like sure you get points for different things but you're you're moving spaceship around you know you're you're building things around stars that sort of thing whereas coimbra all the different elements didn't have that integration feel on the same level for me yeah yeah um, i completely agree yeah and i think that's what it, well and also i mean pulsar i think i like the dice drafting better both games have fantastic dice drafting and I haven't played a game with ice drafting that I didn't like. But yeah, the, just that integration is, is what elevated Pulsar that didn't do it for me with Cambridge. Coimbra. Coimbra, sorry. Yeah, but I mean, I, I like dice drafting so much. And I like those kind of tactical euros mm -hmm. uh, in points. Or I guess it's almost the same thing that the kind of idea of a tactical euro and a point salad are usually interrelated. But I, I enjoy yeah. those types of games right. generally quite yeah. a bit. Although there are a couple this year that that I wasn't huge on uh, crown of Amara. I got to play, which is a somewhat similar game and it just kind of fell a bit flat for me. Yeah. And we should say that it, it is a, a very nice looking game. Oh, the art's spectacular. Yeah. I love the art. Yeah. That's my number five Coimbra number four, just barely edging it out because they do kind of feel like similar weight games in that they're both thinky midweight Euro games. Uh, but this one felt a bit more interactive between the players. Uh, number four is Gugong, a game that neither of you played. I played with someone else, and it is a worker placement style game, I guess. But you have a hand of cards 
with different numbers on them in each of the action spaces. To play that action space, you have to play a card that is a, a greater number than the top card that's there already. And it goes like one through nine. And then I think it's one through nine. And only the one can beat a nine. And then it kind of cycles over and starts over. So there's so much indirect, really passive aggressive interaction. And again, the other aspects of the game like Coimbra aren't as exciting as the core action selection mechanism, but I found it so kind of tightly wound and interactive and exciting to play that I really want to play Gugong some more just to see how far it can go with trying to outthink and kind of plan ahead of everyone else. It's almost got that dominant species kind of thing where everyone is... Every time one of your opponents does something, it really affects how you think about not only your turn, but kind of wondering what their intentions are and where they may block you next. Because you might arrive at a turn and say, okay, I want to, you know, I get four actions or whatever this round, and I want to do this, 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 and this, and what order should I play the cards? Well, that determines, that's determined by what you think the other players want to do and what cards they may have because you have some information about what cards they get basically what cards they hold over and so there's a lot of thinking about the intentions of everyone else and playing around and setting yourself up with you know alternative courses of in case someone blocks you here so a really interactive like high levels of do indirect interaction style euro game uh, i got to play the deluxe version which was very pretty although i've seen the normal one and it looks very nice also that's Gugong. That sounds super interesting. What is the deck? Uh, is it just like four, four suits, one to nine? I don't, th there's no suits or anything. It's basically just one to nine. There's some other, there's other bits and pieces, but that's the core element of the game. I, I, don't, I can't remember the other little mini parts of the game quite as much to describe them to you, but that's the, that's the appeal of it is, is that action selection thing. Yeah, I think I've walked in on you playing it twice and at least one other group of people playing it and have missed out on playing it every time. And it looks interesting, although everyone I've talked to kind of seems to have middling review of it, of it's fun, but it's not great. But It reminded I don't know. me a lot of Trajan. Which I also have not played. Which is a Stefan Feld game where... That's the Moncala one, right? Yeah, it's got a Moncala thing and then all these little mini games basically where you go to the spot and you know you get points and if you go to that spot a lot you can potentially get a lot more points those kinds of mini games with different you know you move you know moving around a dude on a map or almost lisboa styled working with a grid it felt a lot like that but i found the the action selection mechanism in gugong to be much more compelling than the rondel thing in trajan and that's kind of what they're hanging their hats on cuz some of the some of the places in Gugong, in Gugong, one was just like get some points and the the cost to get those points increases as, as people go there so you if you want to go there you go there early there's another one where it's like a temple tr track kind of thing where you move your priest up to different spots and you have to get to a certain spot by the end of the game where you lose basically uh, so there's trying to do that uh, there's moving a guy around a map and you get different bonuses there's this whole ship thing which was a bit convoluted but you know, it's little mini games like that. So if you don't buy into the card action selection thing, the game's not going to work for you. Uh, but I I had a blast in my play. Number three of my top five favorite games of 2018 is Let's Make a Bus Route. A, another Japanese game, I believe, yeah, Japanese because it's set in Tokyo. A roll and write, or rather a, a flip and write, or a reveal and move, or I don't know. It's, it's a roll and write with a deck of cards. Uh, unfortunately, not available in the U.S., or at least hasn't been printed in the U.S. You might be able to find it at some shops or from obscure websites, but this is by far my favorite of that genre of game right now. I haven't played a ton of them, but I had an absolute blast with Let's Make a Bus Route. You have a centralized board where you're all moving your bus route, um, and you're trying to set it up so you pick up a lot of certain types of passengers before you hit a spot where you drop them off. So if you pick up like five tourists before you hit a tourist destination, you get more points than if you picked up, had two tourists on your bus 
when you hit that destination. So you're trying to plan this route, but you don't want to cross through the routes of other people very often or else you'll start to lose points. And there are other little things like if you hit a traffic signal spot, you get to move one further so you can increase the size, of your, the length of your route. So a lot of those kind of familiar elements with that genre of game, but I think is really, really elevated by the fun theme and the fact that everyone's riding on this same board in the middle and you're kind of interacting with each other that way. I really, really hope this gets another, this gets a printing in the U.S. because people ought to play this game. I, I loved it. Yeah, I I love the idea of all being, uh, all interacting on the same board in some way. I think overall I've been disappointed with the rule and rights that I've played. I don't know. It's an interesting fad almost that's happened over the last couple of years. But but this one, it, just that you're interacting on the same board uh, sounds really compelling to me. So I'm disappointed that I didn't get a chance to play it. And it's interesting. This is a bit outside of the scope of the podcast, but Tiny Towns is getting a lot of talk, and I got to play that at PAX Unplugged, and hopefully we'll get, be getting a copy of it here soon. And that isn't a roll and write, but it feels like one. It has all the elements hmm. except for the actual rolling and writing. Huh. In other words, you get you have your own little space in front of you, and there's a universal prompt, and everyone changes their space in front of them in response to that prompt Interesting. so in this case it's either someone selecting a color or i guess there's a deck of cards you can use to pick a random color in this case being in tiny towns yeah. and instead of writing on your player board you put a cube on it but besides the actual like changes in the physical components of the game it is a roll and write basically huh interesting Hopefully I'll get to play it more, but I had a, I enjoyed that quite a bit, but I'm curious to see if more... I, when, I, when I interviewed the designer, he didn't conceive it as... In, in thinking about it that way, but I wonder if there will now be a trend of people trying to make a roll and write and then just changing the components to not be that. Yeah. I don't know. Interesting. Anyways, that's number three, let's make a bus route. Number two, which until two days ago was going to be my number one of 2018. It's a game we got very early in the year. We loved it. We hyped it up. It sold very well. Still love it. Have all the expansions. Haven't played the expansions yet. We should do that. And that is Sprawlopolis. A tiny 18-card game from Buttonshy that is, I think, undoubtedly, of the designs I've played by them, undoubtedly the best one. The best micro game yeah. I've ever played. Definitely. So much fun cooperative game where you're building up a town, basically trying to get points for different for randomly selected criteria of arranging the four or five types of you know commercial, residential, industrial spaces. Uh, so it's a it's a spatial puzzle, but it's cooperative. It looks really cool and it's genuinely challenging. It's the gen- one thing it's genuinely challenging and in genuinely, a consistent way. Yeah, and it, it, it's an interesting puzzle, and it's interesting every time we've played it. Yeah, which is impressive, especially for something that's so s- small and tight. Well, it's also impressive to me that every combination of when you set up the game, you flip over three cards, and it's going to give you a, a new rule for how you score points, along with increasing the threshold of how many points you need to score and i don't know how they did it but they they seem to have balanced that very very well because it's always felt challenging to me no matter what combination of cards we we've used i think once it felt like it was they synchronized really well and it was a bit easy but other than that it's it's been a challenge yeah one one thing i appreciate about sprawlopolis is that it's a really tight puzzle as far as games go, it's about as strictly puzzle as it gets, almost. You're just kind of presented with a couple cards, and then you have to put it down on top of the other, or adjacent to the cards that are already down in the way that, that best suits your scoring conditions. But I actually find that it's very kind of inclusive. Like, I've found that any groups that I've played with, um, and we, we like play this in line when we're waiting you know, to get into some event or we just play it in like the 15 minutes between games or before we leave or something like that. Everyone that I've played with has kind of, 
been drawn in and feels a part of it. And I think that's really cool because um, I think the art style has a lot to do with yeah, that. May, it's may, very approachable. Yeah, I think looking. I think that might be it. But like I've played it with people like I love like a really hard puzzle, and I played it with people that typically aren't really like logical puzzle people, and they've all enjoyed it. So anyway, I think that's really cool. Yeah, I think it has a very wide appeal. It's obviously nice in that it fits in a little wallet like all of their games or, or almost all of their games. They have a couple that aren't strictly wallet games and consistently entertaining every single time I play. It is interesting. We like this better than Circle of the Wagons, which has a very similar mechanic but is um, competitive. Yeah, same designer. And it actually came out before Sprawlopolis. I think the main thing is that you use more cards in Sprawlopolis because Circle of the Wagons... You know, it's it's a two player competitive game. Your final result is half the deck, or roughly half the right, deck. Right. Whereas in Sprawlopolis, you actually create a larger structure compared to Circle of the Wagons, yeah. and I think that's a lot of the difference between the two. Is it feels so much more satisfying, and and you know, it gets more complex in terms of decision making and possible ways you can lay out the cards. It, that I yeah. find Sprawlopolis to be a more fun game. And finally, we get to number one on the list, a game I played two days ago, and I absolutely adored, and I looked it up, I'm like, hey, this is a 2018 release. I guess I know where that's going on my list. And this is the game 1822CA. As I said before, we've gotten a little bit into 18xx games, and this is the most recent one I've played. I've played four of them now. Yes, this is the fourth different one I've played, and this is by far undoubtedly my favorite one. It's epic. It's huge. It took us nine hours to play. And the gameplay, I think, meets that kind of epic scale of the game to me. Because I feel like, at least so far in my journey of this genre of game, I'm approaching it very differently from kind of the hardcore 18xx players in that they really focus on the super interactive competitive strategy of the game whereas i look i like them when they feel like a business game where i'm trying to make good business decisions and invest in the right things and make sound decisions to try to like grow my companies in the future in 1822 ca is really more about that rather than like really tricky stock market things and huge liquidation moves and dumping companies on each other and suitcase maneuvers and all that which is cool I'm just not quite as into that aspect of the genre, whereas this one seems firmly on the side of the genre that I like, and it was huge and had so much variation in terms of all these little private companies and minor companies, and really felt like a narrative to me of, in this case, building up the rail infrastructure throughout the entirety of Canada. Undoubtedly my my favorite game that came out in 2018 so far. Yeah, it was awesome. I love playing it. It was so cool to watch the board develop and see what different people were doing and the progression of you you start buying with these kind of minor companies that have one little train and a station and then you eventually fold them into your major companies that are running across the whole country. And everyone is doing that at the same time and you're jogging for position and there's this auction. Whereas many of the other 18xx games, the stock rounds are generally just buying shares of different companies and sometimes selling shares this one there is that but there's also the way you get companies is that you bid on them essentially and there's this offering of a couple majors of several minors and a couple privates i think they're called so you have to you know we we played with five people and everyone agreed it was the best player count because i think the others we played with had played it at four a month ago or something and they said it was a lot tighter and more competitive at five and the way you had to try to see what other people were going for and get companies and figure out how to (laughs) how to fold them in at the right time and all of that was it was so it was so good we're going to do an 18xx podcast at some point where we'll get into the nitty-gritty of the of the game but uh, of the genre rather but the highlights of this one are that you have all these minor and private companies and the other ones I've played, they have, they have usually a few private companies and maybe a couple minor companies or, or something similar to that. And you kind of bid and do an auction at the beginning of the game or in 1846 you draft. And you have those and they usually do a little bit of, of things. Sometimes 
one of them's maybe actually really powerful and people bid it up. You know, it's a bidding thing. You, you, you self-balance it out once you understand the game. And then you kind of have those, and then the real game begins of operating the major companies. 1822CA really not only did it combine all of that into a draft or into an auction every single stock round so that you have to split your attention and figure out how to divide your attention and your resources through the three different types of companies it progressed like on the map and and felt like as following kind of a historical way of progression where you buy a minor company or you take over a minor company and it has a single station on the board and you maybe build out a little bit of track but it it only has access to these very limited trains and it's able to do local runs and then that kind of sustains you for the first portion of the game as you acquire the capital to launch major companies. And then once you launch those, you get better trains and eventually you want to absorb the minor companies into your major companies. And so they get gobbled up and then you get the, those assets and that infrastructure to use. That progression was so cool combined with the gamey element of, of an auction that didn't feel gamey. It felt just kind of like it enabled the game to be played thematically and interestingly. And then you get to run these massive cool routes at the end where I was running a route literally from, what was it, Montreal to Vancouver, mm -hmm. which was huge. I lost the game, but I got to run that route like three times. So that was fun. Yeah, Just the, the scale of it and the progression of it and the epic feeling of the game really hits what I have enjoyed about 18xx games perfectly. That's my top 10. Best games of 2018 so far. Maybe after I play Newton or Smartphone Inc. or any of these other games, I'll amend it in my mind. But none of you will ever know because this is my list for now. I mean, it's it's you permanently might etched in, in audio, digital audio files. You might update them in other ways. What I think I'll do is is eventually I'll do like look back episodes so maybe in two years we'll look back at 2017 and see if anything's changed you know do like a three-year look back oh maybe. look we still love gloomhaven <laughs> maybe maybe we'll, we'll hate it maybe the expansion will be it, terrible and it'll completely ruin it for us didn't i say that gloomhaven was my game of the year a couple weeks ago probably you know 2017 of 2018 <laughs> of 2018 <laughs> Well, it is the game we, I played the most in 2018. Oh, yeah, it is. Yeah, I dug through and I looked up the statistics of my recorded plays. And sitting at the top, Gloomhaven, I played 24 times in 2018. Spirit Island, I played 11 times. Uh, so that's, you know, one or one and two times a month on average. That feels pretty good. Below that, uh, the games that got eight and seven plays were Codenames, Magic the Gathering. I only count in in person paper plays of Magic the Gathering, by the way, or else it'd be substantially higher. Onitama, Dice Forge, and Keyforge. So a collection of smaller games that either I played a bunch back to back or like code names. I just through living, you know, through existence, just happened to find myself playing semi frequently. Even though I don't think I've ever scheduled a code names game in like three years. <laughs> just happens. Just happens. You know, you're at a party and someone's like, oh, let's play code names. Okay. Around that eight and seven plays for me, there are a whole bunch of eight, seven, six, five of games either I reviewed or smaller games that, you know, I probably played three or four times in a row a couple nights. You get back to kind of the bigger chunk of games that I played between three and five times that are a mix of new games we found exciting and older games that we continually play. So that's what I played the most. Any games of note for you guys that I haven't mentioned yet that are 2018 releases? I'll throw out Dual Powers, oh, which yeah. was fun. We've only played it once. It, we need to play it more to understand it, I think, but um, good first impression at least. Yeah, yeah, that one barely missed my top 10. I definitely liked Forbidden Sky. That was probably a highlight of the releases in 2008. If you like Forbidden Desert, it's, it's not going to completely change your world from you know from that game uh but i but i thought it was really good i like that kind of it, it, it's on the lighter side of good cooperative games that i like yeah i mean i i've only played it the one time and i didn't find it as compelling as for, for Ben desert but i found it 
probably aimed more at gamers like us, so yeah. I'm curious to play it more. It seemed like you need to plan out a lot more in Forbidden Sky to do well. Yeah, I think the initial reaction we had of, you know, this really requires kind of planning your whole strategy out. I think that might have been a little bit overblown. I, I think there's still room to, to adapt, but it's definitely a more puzzly experience. Mm-hmm. I think overall you have far more control. Yes. Um, because with Forbidden uh, Desert, kind of the storm is just raging around every which way. You don't have much control over that. The actual map you kind of construct in Forbidden St- Sky and and the map itself doesn't shift. So ultimately, you have more control. And it's, it's just a more puzzly experience. It's just um, you're trying to con- construct a circuit, which means that you have to plan out where all these components are going to be. Other than than that bit, you know, a lot of the same things. You're still trying to avoid the elements and not die. Mm-hmm. So plus, at the end, you get to complete a circuit, and the spaceship makes spaceship noises and lights up. Yeah, the component so, is awesome. I mean, like, for, who doesn't for, like that? Forbidden Desert has a really cool ship. I don't even know what it's, that is. Flying ship, air, airship, an yeah. airship. Yeah, it's a cool airship. Like Forbidden Sky, one one's up to that. It's just like. It's a rocket it's ship. It's a rocket ship that actually Doesn't blasts it, it does off. a countdown, right? It counts down yeah. when you complete the circuit. Yeah, yeah. 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 Good for game right. They always they have some of the most consistently excellent productions of games and Forbidden Sky is probably the heaviest game they've done, so they they do a lot of children's games in in, in lighter yeah. games. I kind of wish they would do more heavier games, but I completely understand them having a brand. I only say that just because they have consistently excellent productions and I enjoy heavier games more, so I'd like to see them produce heavier games. Yeah. I think my game of the year might be Decrypto. That makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I, I love that that style of game. Despite my criticisms, it is just a blast to play, I think. But I, I really like those those word games. Party games. Mm-hmm. Word party games. It's my kind of party. Yes. Party games where you sit around and think a lot. Yes, silently. Yeah. With no expression. That's, that's the, that's that's the not kind of true. parties I like. <laughs> what if someone made a party game that involved like fractals and physics or something? We're just like s- staring at this like fractal that and, and building a fractal together or something. Sure. Something like that. Yeah. I don't know. As long as we were silently building it. <laughs> Speaking of games where you sit there silently, before the podcast, Matt commented that we ought to record a live play of the mind for the podcast. It'd be riveting. Riveting podcasting. I had to remind him that in a game of the mind, you can't speak. (laughs) Or communicate in any way. Or communicate in any way. I I forgot that you don't announce The only method of communication is silence. (laughs) So, uh, we'll do it sometime, I'm sure. Maybe next day. You, you could literally put it in any uh, any podcast, just in post. Just insert some silence. And, no, no. It's got to have like the, the small sound of like <laughs> cards leaving someone's hand. Or when you lose, everyone going, oh, come on. I can't believe you did that. Or like people shifting around in their seats or like getting a glass of water. It could be narrated. It could be narrated like other... No, uh, I'm really you know, now yeah. into this like avant-garde, <laughs> mostly silence the mind play. We got to make it happen now. <laughs> we'll do it. Here's what we'll do. We'll, we'll, we'll do it, but the video will only be available to patrons. <laughs> The video is already only available to patrons. Right. Somehow, it fits in with what we do already anyway. I don't think that's like a good business play. <laughs> and then we just post the audio file for everyone else. Think about it this way. We could be playing the mind during just about any podcast. You and, wouldn't even know. And it. only the patrons would know. Yeah. I mean, only the patrons know about the cat. It's true. We mention her. I'll, do you edit out all that, though? If she, like, makes noise, but not, like, when Amber brings around the cat in a funny pose for the video. Yeah. I don't mention but, that. But, I mean, out of the audio. I guess now I have. Okay. Well, let's decide if I edit that out or if that's going to be a secret. I guess it's no use as a secret. I mean, I want more patrons. Become a patron of The Thoughtful Gamer and you get to see a cat every episode and her fuzzy Guaranteed. Belly. Guaranteed. Cat is guaranteed. 
Mark, I tried to serve that up to you like so hard and you just kind of like bobbled it for about 30 seconds before. They said we're pros. Yeah. <laughs> we're professionals here. Uh, speaking of disappointments, let's move on to our game of disappoint. Uh, the games that I was most <laughs> disappointed by in 2018, which again, as I said before at the, at the start of the podcast, are some of the biggest games of the year that have gotten all the awards and most accolades and, and such. I mean, the mind got a lot of praise, and I don't, I do not think it's a bad game. I also think it is a game, but I wrote about that already. But I didn't have a ton of fun with it. I think it's pretty good, but I, I didn't dislike it. But it didn't make my top ten. So yeah, I went to. That wasn't a disappointment. I thought it was just as a clever, interesting idea, but didn't create that much of fun of an experience for me. I went to look at BGG, and your disappointment games are like the top four on the list of 2018 I'm, I'm evolving into a real critic <laughs> right where i where i just disagree with the you the just zeitgeist. hate popular things yeah just reactionary and uh what's uh, oh what's the term people use is that the re- reactionary someone who just dislikes something because it's popular i don't know I don't you know. should definitely know this word mark i should know this word but the thing is, I don't dislike popular games usually. Like, I've calculated my, was it R value of BGG rank versus my rank, and it's it correlates very strongly. <laughs> yeah. I like, I mean, if you look at the top, like, 20 games on the list, I think I've given all but three, like, a seven and a half or above. I tend to like the games that people like at large, except for this year. So let's start off with Hunt for the Ring. We we liked the first play, and then it just kind of died on us. But I haven't seen a whole lot of buzz about this game, other than that it's a Lord of the Rings game, and some people got mad at me when I posted the review on Board Game Geek. Which you were kind of going for, but... No, I thought it was a mediocre game, and I gave it a mediocre review. Yeah. I mean, okay. or, or rather, a good review with a mediocre you know, score. I thought it was a well-written review. <laughs> That's a good distinction. Yeah. Yeah, no, I haven't seen much buzz about it. Uh, yeah, the sad. Like, I didn't even... Like, people weren't playing it at PAX. Like, it's just not that intriguing, and I think people figured that and out. I, and we, we had a whole podcast about this, but I think it's hard to make a good hidden movement game also. Yeah, no doubt. Keyforge, I was a bit disappointed. I don't know if I was disappointed. I didn't. I had no idea what I was going to think about Keyforge. I think still the, the way they produce it and all the background of that is really interesting. But as a game, I didn't find it particularly compelling. I thought it was all right. I still need to finish my review. I have like 1,100 words written for Keyforge, and I haven't yet talked about the game. <laughs> I have like 1,100 words about the marketing and what they're trying to do and how that has failed to live up with what the entire point of Keyforge is supposed to be and how, you know, sociological analysis about collectible games and all that. But the second half of the review, which is actually about the game, I need to finish writing. You should take the word pool from that article and procedurally generate your review of it. <laughs> Or at least the title, right? Yeah, definitely the title. Is there some kind of app I can send it through and, and make this happen? Probably. All right, I'm tasking you guys to find this for me. This is this is Matt's new side project when he's bored or at work. Or to program it for me. <laughs> A KeyForge. Does it mach- Inter- 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 machine learning? Intersystems has that for like the motto or yeah. mission statement or whatever. Yeah, yeah. we have a, a, a mission statement generator. Just t- ch- take that and just yeah. change uh, out the, it, the words. I get a, um, sometimes I, I take a pager and I get a reminder email. And it's always sponsored by a random company with a random mission statement. All you right, should I'm- use that. You should take that, that, uh, that file or script or module, whatever, and just replace the word pool with... I don't even My know. My key forgery. Mark can, Mark can supply the key, the word pool and yeah. see what it, it spits out. We'll see what we can do. This is a great idea. This is, but a, this is not yeah, a good idea. I, I feel like Keyforge, I don't know. I don't know how, how much how much legs it You're just have. disappointed that you didn't get an offensive name deck. I am. I can't deny that. I really wanted to get one of the band decks. but You just have to keep buying in. You just keep buying decks. Yeah, just keep buying decks yeah. over and over until, you, until I get one. Exactly. I'm sure the ones they're selling now are on a print run where they've changed the, the word list. Probably. I assume so. So what I have to do is now hunt down really obscure game stores that didn't sell out of that initial run mm-hmm. to get like original printing Keyforge decks. Or spend like $1,000 on eBay. Yeah, or that. I could do that. 
Right, Amber? She's shaking her head at you. <laughs> She's giving me the wild eyes. The other game, well, Rising Sun, we've talked about it. We've talked about times. it so many times. Yeah. We've only played it once. I don't I had a great I had a terrible time playing it. I don't understand it, but I have nothing new to say. So Yeah. What Orion said. And then Root, which I also need to get a review out of well, I need to play it with the full four player count uh, so we've i've played it like three times with three players and and every time with a new player yeah yeah we just got to schedule a time to get a proper play with people who know what they're doing with four players or at least a little bit of what know what they're doing just to kind of get the correct experience for the game i suppose or at least the base game they, they've already gone into like their third expansion now i think anyways so far at least with that with that experience with Root, I was not particularly impressed. I think there's some interesting stuff there. I think, for instance, the birds, their whole mini game is really interesting and yeah. probably the, the most interesting part of the game. But I feel like ultimately it comes down to a really re- reductive political game. At least in our plays so far, it seems to have come down to a really reductive political game that wasn't satisfying and wasn't interesting from a narrative point of view either. Yeah, I didn't think it was that fun. The birds were kind of cool. The cats were pretty bland. The Woodland Alliance was just kind of confusing. That narrative, like the overarching narrative is the same every time. Yeah, kind of. I mean, I guess that varies if you... I mean, that's fine. That's fine if it if it has interesting like micro variations on the way, like the coin games do, right? Or like the inspiration for Root. Yep, and I, I guess that's what they're going for. Or like Pax Premier, which I got an email today, is going to be shipping in June by the designer of Root and was much more fun than Root. But anyway, that's like everyone's number one game of 2018, so I didn't think it was that great. So I got a giant 10-hour long 18xx game and a wallet game on my list. This has got to be I mean, even eclectic. Even on average, list. that's a long... Those are long playing games. Well, not Sprawlopolis. <laughs> yeah, but on average, you're like... A, Five hours. Oh yeah, if you if you average them, yeah, it's about right. All right, that's my disappointments. What are some other? I I looked through and found games that were not released in 2018, but I played for the first time in 2018, and there's some interesting ones in there. Age of Steam, which I would like to play again. That's the classic, but the the reprint is coming, so maybe I'll get a copy of that. Yeah, that one was really it was a really interesting game. Um, I'd need to play it more before I know what to think of it, and I think. I guess also there's like a hundred maps or something that all play there's differently. So many maps. Uh, you know what I found out the other day, randomly looking through Board Game Geek, Bezier Games, makers of Suburbia and a billion werewolf variants, they started out publishing Age of Steam maps. Hmm. They're like first fifteen things they published were Age of Steam maps. Yeah. There you go. Fun fact. I, I bring the facts all day long. That was an interesting one. I don't know if I like if I necessarily like the whole route, the really really focused like route building thing in Age of Steam as much as other aspects of train games like investing. I mean, I like building. 18xx broadly. I had more fun playing 18xx than Age of Steam, but I've only played Age of Steam once, only on one map. I don't, I don't so. really feel like I didn't understand the game until the end of that play. Yeah, uh, we got to play Three Kingdoms Redux. That was a cool game. That was a fun game. I would uh, play that again. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Hanami Koji was one that was highly recommended to me that I got to play and review. Chinatown is an older game we played for the first time that some people really, really adore. I think Sidereal Confluence just kind of beats it up just for being a more interesting, more complex game. Although the simplicity of uh, Chinatown is very charming. Yeah, it is pretty interesting how it the whole game is just negotiation over position and tiles. Yeah. And you're just trying to come out ahead on 100 micro 100 microtransactions. <laughs> yeah, what else did we play? Kanban, one of the older Lacerda games we got to play for game. the first time. Probably so far my least favorite, but I've only played it the once. Uh, Indonesia and You like Venus s- better than Kanban? Probably by a hair. Yeah. Cuz that's your second lowest. Yeah. So I would go Gallerist and Lisboa are the top 2. Lisboa and then the Gallerist and then probably the Venus then Kanban probably. Yeah, the more I play the Gallerist, the more I think I like the other games better. The Gallerist is certainly the simplest and probably the easiest to kind of figure out, but I don't know. I don't feel like I I'm like necessarily, necessarily good at it because I generally lose the Gallerist, 
but I just enjoy the other games better. I think Lisbo is so much more interesting. Venos we'd have to play again, and Kanban. I think the first player, the choosing your time turn order choosing Mm -hmm. is better than the bumping pawns in gallerist yeah although maybe the cycle is more interesting in gallerist i don't know i don't know i'm just waiting for the now confirmed i think for a long time rumored uh deluxe reprinting of kanban with what's what's the artist that you know tool oh okay i was thinking of a different name but yeah yeah the same treatment that all those games have gotten in the last few years Indonesia, an older splatter game I got to play, which was very bizarre. I would be interested in playing it again, but it's a splatter game. It was it was cool, along with lots of other games. Any any particular memories from 2018 that stand out to you guys? Gloomhaven, <laughs> lots of Gloomhaven, lots of Gloomhaven. We did play some uh, some pretty awesome Skull in my bachelor party. Oh that yeah, that's right. Yeah, Skull was good. Uh, that's the first time I'd played it, and it did not disappoint. There, there was some pretty, there were some pretty funny moments the next day when the girls came over, and Pam, who Pam was ruthless. See, it was incredible every, to watch. Everyone thought Pam was ruthless. Pam actually was just th- that. Was just Wes was overthinking, trying to figure out what game Pam was playing, and Pam actually wasn't playing any game at all. <laughs> But I have since played Skull again with Pam, and uh, she does like it now. Yeah. Skull Skull is interesting because it's just on the right side of the, like, win-lose banana partition. (laughs) Right, yeah. Where win-lose banana is on the other side. So it just barely works. Yeah. Right? Because, like, win-lose banana is the... It's just flipping a coin. (laughs) Well, it can be. But if you think about it, oh, so many of these like social deduction games are just that. It's just looking at a person and saying, are they lying or not? Right? Which is kind of what Skull is, but there's just enough there. There's just there's, enough there's, to make it interesting. There's this pushing your feel like There's this push blank. your luck yes. element where Yeah, in the, I think the push your luck ties it all together. It's it's more it's not just that you have to figure out if someone is lying. You have to figure out which is the least likely place that someone is lying <laughs> or trying to kill you. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, there's just um, enough there. And then there's a push your luck of how far can you go and how many. And then at the end, it kind of changes to almost this different game theory of like, everyone knows what tiles I have and I have to bluff my way out of this bad situation to have a chance to win. Yeah. Whereas the first half of the game is like this push your luck deduction and then the second half becomes almost this game theory puzzle more so. But it is fun, especially late at night. For sure. It's Wes, great. Wes, who is watching our stream for patrons, friend of ours, is saying he takes full credit for introducing us to Skull. Yes. Yes. I, I believe it was his idea. It was his idea to bring yeah. it. I've, I'd heard of the game. Shut up and sit down and talked about it for a long, long yeah, time. Yeah, I'd heard of it. That's where I We played it. a game of it on the podcast. Oh, yeah, we did. With uh, just a deck of playing cards. That's right, because I played right. it at a meetup. That's right. Okay. I got to play it at a meetup. Okay. And then I was like, oh, this is clever. And then we played with a deck of cards. But then I kind of forgot about it. Wes, I will say I'll give you full credit on revitalizing it in my mind mm-hmm. and getting it to the bachelor party. Yep. Yeah, it's a fun game. Highlight for me was playing Brass for the first time in Enbra. Oh, which, yeah. That was pretty cool. And then bringing um, Brass back And bringing to us, Brass which back, yeah. been a great, great game. Yeah. I, I was trying to think of any memories that I hadn't talked about, but, like, my favorite gaming memories are, like, the cons and stuff that we've already talked about. I guess meeting a lot of game designers and, and such while at, like, PAX Unplugged was cool. So, like, yeah. meeting Brad Talton, who's such a really, really nice guy, uh, the guy who runs Level 99, games millennium Millennium blades exceed pixel tactics all that the nicest guy possible randomly inviting isaac over to play games on some thursday yeah that was a lot of fun that was a lot of fun (laughs) who since has has become a friend yeah those kind of connections i'm not particularly social or good at those kinds of interactions but the little bit i've had and been able to initiate at cons and such Mm -hmm. have been universally very very fun so Mm -hmm. i suppose that's my highlight I've, i've gotten to know more people in the biz in 2018 in the new england board gaming circle that too yeah oh and the twitter the board gaming twitter <laughs> yeah yeah twitter i had one tweet that kind of got got a good number of uh retweets i went like minor viral <laughs> got like 50 retweets i think that was the uh That's, um 
any game's a legacy game if you can hold a grudge really well. <laughs> oh, is that the one you that? That's my best like, tweet. Yeah, best one. Okay, I, I peaked there. That's certainly more retweets than I've ever gotten. Yeah, there you go. I've never gotten a retweet, so you've never been retweeted. I only have like eight tweets that aren't replies. <laughs> I was gonna say I don't recall you ever <laughs> tweeting that aren't direct replies to your tweets. I'll have to re- retweet one of those one time. Anyways, 2018, even though it didn't have the standout games that years past have had, was still a very, very fun year for me in gaming and for the Thoughtful Gamer, and I've already had a ton of fun in 2019. Uh, lots of really fun stuff. We're going to be playing a bunch of Lacerda games soon. We've been playing a lot of um, Coin as well, playing mm-hmm. through the Coin series. Oh, yeah. Yeah, playing through the Coin series in order. We're getting back to that on this weekend as well. Mm -hmm. Playing a lot of 18xx, um, me especially. I've been playing more of those. Yeah. Those are a lot of fun. Good times for games. Thanks for listening, everybody. Don't forget to check out thethoughtfulgamer.com. Check me out on social media, on Twitter and Facebook. If you see Matt tweet, retweet it. Don't forget to rate the podcast on iTunes. How are people going to see me tweet? I don't have any followers. I'm not asking for followers. I'm I'm just saying that it's impossible. Go find Matt. It's impossible. (laughs) He won't that clog up your newsfeed. <laughs> the he, algorithm will, will talk re- him safely he, he, away. He might retweet some hockey analytics, and he will reply to Mark's board game Twitter. <laughs> yes. Matt's basically my Twitter hype man. Yeah. Anytime I tweet something, he's like, yeah. <laughs> that, I, that's why I'm here. <laughs> Watch out. You're that's gonna why get... you make the big I, you know, I am sure that Twitter just thinks that I'm a bot. That... <laughs> That you are controlling, so I'm probably doing you more harm than than, probably than good. Yeah, some. some of our well, friends think you are a bot <laughs> because they've never met you. <laughs> That's also true. I assure you, I'm not a bot. That's exactly what a bot would sh- would say. Anyways, go rate the podcast and check out the website soon, or maybe by pro- hopefully by the time this goes up, I will have the new logo up on the site, and it looks awesome. And- just trying to con- convert it to everything. Buy some merch once that exists. Yeah, yeah. I'll have the t-shirt up, and you can go buy a t-shirt of the sweet new logo, which looks great. Thanks for listening, everybody. Goodbye. Goodbye. Night. <laughs>